All right, so my name is Thomas Singes. I'm Development Coordinator at Blender, and I have the pleasure to host the Lightning Talks this evening. Unfortunately, my amazing computer decided to die 20 minutes ago. So uh, we will have to improvise a bit, but uh, it should be OK. But please, uh, my upfront apologies if some videos or some things in the presentations won't show because we have to improvise now. That's unfortunate, but I'm really sorry for that. So um, let's get started with the first lightning talk uh, by Svenja. So Svenja, please come up to the stage and give her a big round of applause, please. So hello, everyone. In the next five minutes, I want to show you something you cool I noticed you can do in Blender, which is light field simulation. First of all, who am I? My name is Svenja Strobel. I'm one of the co-founders of Vertex Wizards, and the main thing I do with Blender is realistic 3D scans, models, and materials. Apart from that, I'm also a computer science master's student at the FAU University in Germany. And for my bachelor's thesis, I was working with light field displays for around nine months. I wrote a paper regarding more efficient rendering algorithms for these displays, and then also held a paper presentation at the I3D conference in Seattle earlier this year. For the, paper <laughs> for the paper presentation, I wanted to have like a simple macroscopic demonstration of how these displays work, simply as an introduction for my viewers. And for that, and that's how I even came to trying to simulate light field displays in Blender. So first of all, for those of you who don't know what light field displays are, they're basically these 2D displays that create a three-dimensional effect when looking at them without the need of you having to wear any 3D glasses or anything. The, be the perfect light field display is supposed to kind of look, appear like looking through a window at the displayed 3D content. And for you to understand what you're seeing in my quick Blender demonstration in a minute, a very quick introduction to how, these, how this 3D illusion is created. The general idea with light field displays is that you render the scene multiple times from slightly different angles, and then you just combine all of those views into one kind of squished interlaced image. This is then the image that's displayed on the LCD display of the light field display itself, and in front of it you have a set of lenses which then filter back out the individual views to the viewer depending on the angle that he's looking at the display at. And that's what I now wanted to recreate in Blender, just with a very simple setup. I just wanted to recreate kind of like such a camera pan simulation you can see here. And for the interlaced image, which kind of represents the LCD display, I just used this very basic striped image where the individual views are just different colors. And in front of it, I s put my set of cylindrical lenses with, with that just have a very simple glass material. I tried to calibrate the width of the lenses as well as the distance of the lenses to the display as good as I possibly could in my limited amount of time, and then just added a very simple camera pan animation to that. The result of this very simple experiment here was actually surprisingly good. It did the, basically the same thing as the real display does, which is filtering out the views depending on the view angle. In this case here, just the different colors. And the reason I'm showing you that this is possible in Blender is that I would love to inspire someone to actually do this, but more fancy, like with, <laughs> like with much thinner lenses and a, very, and a more interesting interlaced image with, that isn't just simple colors. And I think you could create really cool 3D animations and renders using this, and I would love to see it. And yeah, that was already it from me. I hope you maybe learned something. And if you want to learn more about light field displays, come talk to me later. <laughs> All right, uh, next up is Timothy. Timothy, please come on stage and please give him a big round of applause as well. Yeah, it's 
it's a PDF. test? Good enough. Okay. Good enough. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim, hailing from Hong Kong. And today, I wanted to introduce to everyone uh, the wonderful work we're doing with Blender Studio in China. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm from Crystal Institute, and we do open source education in Hong Kong and hopefully internationally um, in the years going forward. So we've been working with Blender Studio since 2019, uh, and we are helping them localize their resources, their wonderful hundreds and thousands of hours of content, making it accessible for viewers uh, in other parts of the world. So the challenges we face so far are that, one, we need to find talent that has both the language and domain expertise. They need to know and understand the functions in Blender. They need to understand what open movies are all about. They need to understand how the pipeline works. And they also need to be multilingual. Right? And getting, this is all voluntary work. So uh, getting the talent to help us out has been difficult. But if anyone wants to join our wonderful journey, uh, we welcome you. Uh, so far, we're working with English and Mandarin and Cantonese. So, uh, but if you have uh, other language expertise and would like to localize, um, please come talk to us. Secondly, uh, we need to build a multilingual interface uh, on the web and uh, incorporate video player uh, capabilities as well. And something else uh, that's our major concern is it's a moving target. Right? Blender Studio content updates daily, so our uh, our updates have to be daily as well. So uh, managing that has been an um, interesting journey. So here, here's what we've built so far. Number one, we've built a multilingual website. right? So we managed to uh, work with Python and Django in the back end. And we've now built a successful website that handles both simplified and traditional Chinese. And we've translated hundreds and hundreds of con hours of content uh, from English. Uh, and originally, there was no subtitles on Blender Studio. So we had to work with just the audio content, transcribe it into subtitles, translate into Chinese, and then also offer Chinese audio content as well. But now our video player is successfully able to uh, output uh, different versions of content. And we're able to watch all of the open movie content, all of the tutorials online successfully. Our video player had to be updated as well. Um, so before, it was just single, uh, single audio and single sub subtitle. And we now edited it successfully. So now we can watch different versions of this content. This is the pipeline that we've built up. We've gone from English audio to English text to Chinese text to Chinese audio. Every step has now been optimized. And with the help of AI, it's much faster now. And now we can be more ambitious and think about our future goals. Right? One other thing that's very important is payment support. Um, the resources that uh, we're collecting, the money that we're collecting, is shared with Blender right, to contribute to their development, um, like Blender Studio in Europe. And uh, we've now uh, made it accessible for Chinese users to contribute to the support of Blender as well. Upcoming next, uh, these are the functions that we hope to build in the future. Number one is community proofreading. So we're a small team based in Hong Kong, and we've been doing this for years. And we have the expertise, but we need everyone's help to make this uh, reality for everyone in the world. We don't want it to just be for English speakers or Chinese users. Uh, we spoke with Francesco, and he's really interested in getting the Spanish uh, community on board with this. And if anyone would like to localize for their community, please talk to us. We have the pipeline. We have the knowledge uh, to do it. But uh, we'd like to hear from you guys uh, where we, what we should do next. Second is automated content sync. This is also something we're working with the Blender development team on. Um, how do we get the uh, content straight from Blender Studio synced with our database and uh, get the translation process automated as much as possible? And finally, as I mentioned, hopefully even more languages in the future so everyone can get access to this awesome content. So watch this space. Uh, if you guys want to get a demo of the existing site in Chinese, feel free to scan our QR code. And uh, this is some of our work uh, that we're doing in education and open source in Blender and much, much more. All right. Thank you so much for your time.
So, thank you so much, Timothy. And next up is Sebastian Koenig. Please come to the stage. A big round of applause for him. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Sebastian Koenig. I'm from BlendFX, which is a small 3D and visual effects studio in Leipzig in Germany. And uh, this year we got the chance to do the visual effects for a German documentary TV series for uh, Luby, which is about uh, a cop in Berlin who kind of stumbled into crime and became a car thief. So it's a, it's a fascinating story and the guy is also a fascinating man uh, with an interesting story. And, um, but he had to go to jail because, well, he was a car thief and he was uh, caught. And um, the filmmakers, uh, which is uh, Jan Peter and Sandra Naumann with the producers uh, Frisbee Films and Wolfpack Vision, um, they uh, interviewed him just before he went to jail. And um, for that, they went into a green screen studio. So uh, for two days, they interviewed him. And um, from these two days of interview material, they carved out four episodes of the series, and each episode um, had, a, had a topic. And for each topic, they wanted to have like a, a room that he's sitting in while he's being interviewed. Um, and uh, Jan-Peter asked us to, to do these uh, shots, so we did that. Um, so, each uh, interview or each, uh, each room has three to five different cameras, and uh, we built these uh, shots with Evie so that in each episode uh, he has three cameras from different angles uh, where he's sitting in and then he's being interviewed. And uh, the showrunner asked us to, to make it not quite photoreal, but a little bit more stylized, a little bit uh, unreal, kind of. Um, so we were happy that in Eevee we could have the, the bloom and uh, depth of field in real time. Um, so we built these uh, environments uh, in Eevee uh, it was a very, very great uh, experience to work with the filmmakers and internally it was a nice uh, workflow. Um, so, this is uh, the scene in Blender in Eevee. We exported the keyed material so that we can put him um, into the uh, camera background and then arrange the shots from that perspective. Working in Eevee is of course nice because you have real-time feedback um, we didn't even bother to, to do any light baking or stuff like that. It's just like, like Blender internal, just lighting with different lights. Um, yeah, so that's that. Then we have the, the, the interview situations. Then a couple of shots that are a little bit special. Um, like this one, for example, it's uh, from the last episode where he's remembering his life. Um, so he's um, in the nightclub and then, then he has to go to jail. And then one more of the kind of a breakdown. <coughs> so we were lucky that he didn't have any hair because we had to do <laughs> <laughs> we had to do 500 shots, and that made life easier for us. Um, they wanted to have uh, an explosion uh, in the background, and we did that with Embergen and imported that as a VDB file into Blender, uh, which worked amazingly good. So uh, having the real-time feedback is, of course, uh, very nice, even with the fire. So that was, uh, that was great. So we rendered an EV, but we did not use the Blender compositor to do 500 green screen shots. I mean, there's uh, limits. Um, <clears throat> so the pipeline was to, um, to, uh, to start in Blender and then render as an OpenXR, then go to DaVinci Resolve, uh, export that to an MXF file and uh, in an ARRI white gamut and then deliver that to uh, the post-production who did the uh, grading. And I want to briefly um, cover this uh, color workflow um, because um, when we render in EV uh, and export as a linear XR and then just open that, it will look like totally over 
overexposed uh, exposed and uh, like this so like this so, so we didn't we, we wanted to to have it look the like the filmic look we, we wanted to have that so uh, we found a great tutorial by Poli Fjord on YouTube thank you uh, and I want to just <laughs> go over that it uses uh, a file from uh, Troy Sobotka um, who I don't know he I think he doesn't approve um, but it, it was working so uh, so basically, you download the, this uh, uh, color config folder. You put it into the LUT uh, directory of DaVinci Resolve, and you render your EXR files. Then you um, then you, ha you have your uh, the, the LUT files in DaVinci. You can choose the what is it? The scene linear to base encoding profile. Then you put that. We use a, a mat input in, in Resolve. So we have that, and then after that, um, you put in a second LUT, which is then applying the, the base or medium contrast, whatever you want. And after that, we converted that to um, uh, to the Ari White gamut, so from Rec 709 in Blender to the uh, Ari White gamut. And then we could uh, put this as a background, then have the, the keyed elements uh, in the foreground, and then after that, deliver that to, to grading. Uh, the grading department was very happy, so we were happy as well. Um, the showrunners liked the shots. Um, Luby himself was happy at the premiere, um, so it was a, a nice project. And I want to show a little tiny bit of the... <laughs> so at this point you would have seen the, the trailer. Um, if you want to uh, watch it, it's a very nice uh, uh, series. It's, uh, I recommend it, not just because of the Blender work, but the, in the story is interesting. Go to the RID Mediatek. Um, the link would have been in the video. Well, now you have to Google it yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, thanks a lot, Sebastian. I guess German Tat out next. Yeah. Awesome. And all right. And next up is uh, Eos Fox. Please come to stage and please give her a big round of applause as well. So, hi, wonderful Blender people. What I'm presenting is the opening show of one of the bigger fan conventions in Europe. Bigger means 3,000 and more people. A few years ago, me and some friends took, off, uh, um, took on this show and said, we need to make it more nice because it's boring, people don't come anymore, and we want information to get out. So we started, and everything on that convention and everything you will see is done by volunteers. Nobody get paid. The only thing we get paid in is fun, and it's hard to maintain sometimes, but we still love it. And so no money, but a lot of motivation. So the only choice for any kind of film was, of course, Blender. And back then, because it was 2018, I had no idea. I had no idea what I was going into, and had no idea about actually animation when it comes to film. I was a low poly 3D animator at some point, and I got some help with rendering, but oh, I don't want to see this anymore. So the second show the next year was a bit better. Oh, the result from the year before was at the end, um, a parody of a flight attendance video. So we finished it, we showed it. So the next year, the theme was time travel. So we had a full in front show where the character would come on stage and say, oh no, my timeline is wrecked. And the actors on stage would interact with it and resulted in a laser show. Um, the uh, team grew by that a bit more and more and we had to work a lot also with people on stage and off stage. This was really, really nice. So, and then, Corona hit, but it did us good because we learned. We didn't stop learning during Corona. The team got a bit different, people changed, 
um, we're like completely redesigning the character again. And uh, first time fur, facial animation, a professional, much more professional. And I can't show the full show because it's more than one hour. But uh, please show that video. Number three. And yeah, and there were many more videos that um, changed with people on stage, depending on the department. Hey, I've heard voices from over there. There will be the So that was the free. A lot better, a lot better. And then we were actually thinking, okay, fourth year. So I think we finally know what we're doing. We fought. So we were like, okay, revamp of the character. The uh, theme of the uh, the theme of the convention this time was magic, black magic. So we got her that little thing, and I was like, I learned so much rigging. I want to show off. Made a new rig. So, and then we were like, oh, she would be so cool if she has a, like a second character. And we we're like, yeah, let's make a second character. We pulled that off. And then we were like, oh, it would be so cool if she would brew a potion and we would have an interactive object on stage that when someone speaks at the end, he drops something in and it wrecks in the same colors that we have in the video. And then we did it. By the time we grew by a lot, like over a, uh, don't pin me down of the numbers because I'm a bit nervous, as you can guess. Um, but by that time, we have now two musicians making music for us. We have uh, eight um, artists. We have many more in the back, a story person. Uh, oh, so much more. But um, we are, like, this is the crabby animator concept artist, and like mine. So, and that's why my team made of it, her background. And then, of course, we have VFX that I just, yeah, we have gear notes, but I can't explain about that did my artists. And we also use grease pencil. Thank you, Spider-Verse. And then, um, because I run out of time otherwise, that was the cauldron live on stage, and that's the footage. Changing the course of time. Hmm? I know, I know. Yeah, that should do. Hmm? Oh, I forgot to turn it on. <laughs> Let the ritual begin! A little bit of this thing. <laughs> and I thought I would never have to do this bibbity bobbity boo kind of thing anymore. Uh, but here. And we hereby, are. I declare your friends 2023 open. A big, big, big thank you to Blender, because without you, nothing of this would have ever happened. I would not have been where I am right now. Big, big, big thank you to my f team, where I'm their art director and art lead, and they're way too humble with me. Thanks to them. And there's much more to learn. So next year, our theme is Cyberpunk. <laughs> See you, Ben. Okay, so thanks a lot. Next up is Greg. Hi. 
Okay, so I apologize for the clickbait, but last week we went to Rostock in Germany to photo scan the moon lab. Um, there is a facility there, which I will explain later, but first, who are we? Who am I? I run Polyhaven. We make free assets of various kinds. We release them for free for anyone under CC0, and we try and focus on quality over quantity, and it's mostly supported by donations. So polyhaven.com, I hope you have heard of it, but right, so the moon. The moon is cool. Um, for me, I like space things. I'm a nerd. Um, the one interesting thing about the moon is that there is no GPS. So if you want to make a robot that goes and drives around on the moon all by itself without a pilot, how does it know where it is? I don't know. Maybe it has cameras. So on Earth, we have self-driving cars. Maybe on the moon, they're the same. Maybe they use cameras for image-based navigation. But image-based navigation requires a lot of data to train those algorithms to be able to figure out how to move around. And the moon doesn't actually look like the Earth, unfortunately. So the, there's no atmosphere, so you don't have a sky. There's not a lot of fill light. You have the bright sun, and your shadows are very dark. Obviously, it's expensive to go there and gather the data. So unfortunately, we have to simulate the data, uh, which is where I come in. So we were invited to go to Germany last week to photo scan some fake moon dust, which they call uh, lunar regolith simulant because it's fake. And that's basically made by or made with the same rocks that the moon is made from, which is just various kinds of different rocks you find on Earth. And then they grind them all together into really, really small particles. And those particles are really small and really sharp. And they're kind of bad for you. And they're also really bad for anything that they touch. So if you put your camera accidentally in the moon dust, uh, it's, you're kind of screwed. You can't really clean it off because it's basically sandpaper that's in the air. So you have to use a lot of protection. And luckily, you can move it around using any gardening equipment like rakes and sieves, as you'll see in the next photos. So it's very soft and very fine. It's like flour, but it will give you cancer a little quicker. <laughs> uh, that's because it's very sharp, small particles. If you breathe it in and it goes in your lungs, it's not the best. Um, and every time you, you take a step, you can see in that image there's big clouds everywhere, which you kind of have to deal with and keep your cameras far away. And then you have to wait an hour or two for that dust to settle. But once that's happened, you can basically photo scan it. So we built this rig that does most of the hard work for us so that we don't have to walk around making dust the whole time. And we basically just stand there for two and a half hours um, waiting for the robot to do its job. So we use a ring flash with that motorized rail and stand around and try not to drop the camera. And then basically what that results in, those two and a half hours of standing around, is 1,500 photos across a seven meter area, which is a total of about a million megapixels, or a terapixel if you want to sound cool. And that, for us in our first test, was 1.7 billion polygons, uh, which is what that looks like. And that's a small piece of it. And that's another small piece of it. And that's it. So. Unfortunately, I didn't put a link, but eventually, these will be probably next year sometime, we will publish these on Polyhaven for free for everyone, and maybe we help make some space robots walk around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Um, and now we have uh, coming up next, Nico. Please come to the stage. Okay, that's me. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, I'm Nico. I'm from Germany, and I am a 3D artist. Uh, basically, like a 3D generalist, um, I like to do a short, uh, yeah, a blender short films. Uh, with those characters that you see there. Uh, these are some of my creations. And uh, I was always interested in um, creating, or uh, in the movie making process uh, all, uh, already as a kid, but um, I never had the opportunity to do so. But uh, yeah, a few la years later, uh, Blender came along, and suddenly I was a director and a producer and animator and editor and a sound effects guy, so uh, that was really exciting, and is still. 
So, um, yeah, uh, my name is Demnico Art, uh, usually on the internet, so if you uh, want to check me out, uh, sure. Uh, I have a Patreon, um, <coughs> so if anyone's interested. <laughs> uh, I'm going mostly for like this uh, kind of love, death, and robots uh, thing that's uh, really cool. So, uh, if anyone's here actually working on love, death, and robots and you need some support or anything, then. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I brought a short uh, I, um, reel, but before that, I just wanted to say uh, one thing. Um, in like in these times, like it's super uh, convenient or a, a normal thing for us to have like tutorials everywhere for everything. That's how the whole blend <laughs> Blender community like lives off, and. Uh, Sometimes it's, we take it very much for granted that we have all those resources from all those amazing people that are also here uh, that that they like uh, dedicate their life to uh, teaching us Blender. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but making tutorials actually really hard. So it's, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of recording. It's really, really hard. And uh, that's why I think um, you deserve a really, really big thank you for me and probably from everyone because for me, you are not just like content creators that just put stuff out there for free, but you're actually like proper teachers. And uh, I think that's a very noble and honorable thing to do. So I want to give a huge thank you for, uh, to all the content creators or teachers uh, because without you, I wouldn't be here. Uh, many of you, uh, us wouldn't be here. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> And um, yeah, uh, now back to me. So, uh, <laughs> so here's my showreel, what I do, uh, and enjoy. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, now next up is Yaroslav uh, with his podcast Subsurface Talks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, so hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jaroslav Zedze, uh, but you can all call me DJ. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an interior designer, uh, a 3D generalist, uh, currently working as a community manager for CG Boost, uh, so helping people learn in Blender generally. Um, and I'm an introvert. So any other introverts around here? Maybe raise your hands. Ah, so, so good, because you know, a lot of people kind of scare me. <laughs> All right, so what do you do when, you, uh, when you're an introvert and you're a CG, uh, CGI geek, so to speak? Um, well, you start a podcast, right? And that's what I did. Uh, last, uh, last April, I recorded the first episode of my uh, podcast, Sub Subsurface Talks. Well, in fact, I've, I've had some experience with the podcasting before that, like I was doing the CG Talks podcast, for, uh, but that was for a brand... Uh, GarageFarm.net, uh, a huge thanks for them for uh, contributing to the Blender Dev Fund. Uh, you guys rock. And, uh, but I wanted to go indie and just you know, talk about Blender uh, with uh, 
fellow guys. I'm really interested in uh, all of what you do. Like some, some guests, like you can see here, uh, I've met uh, at the previous year Blender conference, so I'm hoping for some more guests. You're welcome to, to join and talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, online. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to say is also like uh, throughout this podcasting journey, I've met like really amazing people. And sometimes they were just like just before jumping to some really amazing stuff. So, of course, no credit for me to that, but I'm just like a happy witness of that all happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, recently I've heard that Andrew, Andrew Price, who did also a podcast like his, he paused it. So there's my chance now. <laughs> Thank you all, and uh, if you want to join me in this podcasting journey, you're welcome. And you can check it out on YouTube, but also on podcasting platforms like Spotify and, and other ones like Apple Music, stuff like that. Just Google subsurface docs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is Tal. Hello, so I'm Tal, I'm an animator by day and add-on developer by night. I was uh, developing animation layers add-on, uh, and now I'm working on a new add-on called the Anim Toolbox, which is a set of tools for animation and temporary controls. Uh, so yeah, this is like an overview from some previous version uh, with all the, tool all the tools. So the first tool, it's a uh, temp IK. So it basically creates an uh, external rig with uh, IK controls. And this is really useful if you want to do a quick uh, editing for motion capture or if you need uh, something like an elbow leaning on a table and you don't have this available in your rig. So you can create quick, a quick uh, temp IK, and then when you done using it, you bake it back to your original rig. So this is uh, temporary world space controls. Um, this is basically a space switching. So you bake to a temp control, then use the interactive keyframe offset, which you can offset the keyframe back and forth, and if you go to zero, it goes back to the original keyframes. And this is a world space in-betweener, so it works like the normal in-betweener in Blender, but it's in world space, so it's very useful for locking legs in space or doing offset. This is blend to mirror. Instead of like doing a full symmetry, you can make a not complete symmetry, isolated, selected armatures. It's when you go into pose mode, uh, you see only your rig. So it's really useful when you work with a lot of characters and you don't understand what's going on in the screen. And this is the markers retimer. It's kind of like the retimer in Maya, but, but you use markers. And this is just to use markers for uh, to have some more interactive uh, time uh, time ranger. And this is the copy paste word matrix, which also calculates uh, uh, parent constraint, not parent constraint, link, uh, child of constraints, which was always a problem in Blender. And the next video, it's um, it's the last thing I. I worked on, and it's a new bake, especially for the temporary controls. So it has a smart bake, so it basically you, you stay with the original Temp keyframes you are had. now having a new bake method. It is now possible to bake and clean only a selected chain of bones separately, instead of baking and removing the whole rig setup. Smart bake will use the keyframes count from the original bones or from the temp control bones keyframes. Handles are recalculated to match the temp control values. If there are not enough keyframes or smart bake is turned off, then it will bake on every frame within each bone's frame range.
Yeah, so basically the idea of... So eventually the idea is to have a complete set of temp controls that you can just even have like a, a base, like a bone setup and you can w animate while like creating controls, removing them and you just like walk back and forth. Or if you just have a rig and you want to go beyond its limitations, um, that's it. Awesome, thanks a lot. Uh, you see almost no glitches, it works perfectly, everything. <laughs> so next up is Jason Van Gamster. Please give him a big round of applause. Hello, hi. Whoop, there's a slide. Oh, mm, forward, back. Hi. hi. How are you guys doing? Great. Yes, all right, good. So I'm at this Blender Conference, and I'm talking about Blender Conference LA, which is not sold out. It hasn't been had tickets yet. Just in case you don't know, I'm Jason Van Gumster. I work with Autotroph, which Autotroph does CG Cookie, Blender Market, Orange Turbine, and Beacon LA. So just to let you know what's going on with it, it's going to be two full days of content. Basically, people have been coming up and asking questions about it, and this is a lightning talk to give you kind of answers. So two full days of content. We're having two concurrent sessions at the venue, because there is a venue, which is two miles away from the Hollywood sign, because it's in Los Angeles. Also, we're looking at having 250 people show up and 25 plus speakers showing up for it. We've started asking some folks, and we're going to be opening up the asking for folks pretty shortly. This is the venue. It's the Fonda Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Pretty cool venue. They do a lot of music shows there. They're not entirely sure what to do with a bunch of 3D nerds showing up, but we're going to have so much fun. <laughs> so it's going to be great. So yeah, that was a short and sweet one. That right there, where'd it go? This right here, you should scan that. That goes to beaconla.org. The big thing on that is that there's a button at the top that says, get more information. See, tickets are going to go on sale in January. And there are 250. There's a lot more than that in here. And uh, people on that mailing list get notified first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And next up is uh, Marius with, uh, re with the yearly Render Street update. Hi, everybody. It's so hard to get on stage after Jason, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm Marius from Render Street. Uh, if you guys don't know what Render Street is, you should. And uh, I won't tell you, just ask your friends. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I've been coming here every year for my five minutes of fame to tell you what we've been doing the previous year on Render Street. But uh, this year, earlier this year, we've just uh, accomplished, we, we've reached our 10 years of activity. So this means, thank you. This means we, we've been rendering projects for you guys for 10 years and I thought that's not nothing. And so let's start with that. So thank you everybody uh, who has helped us to reach this point. I have to admit when we started the business, I didn't really look that far in the future, but now that we are in, at, in our 10th year, I look forward to the next 10 years, right? And uh, one more thing, uh, I don't usually brag about this, but your support has helped us to be a sponsor for every Blender conference since 2016. So thank you again for that, for allowing us to, to do that. Um, so I'm not going to bore you with uh, what we've been doing in the past year, but I want to uh, just mention one point. A lot of you maybe are using the, our monthly subscription plan, so earlier this year, We've upgraded the machines that are running this plan to ones that are twice as fast. So this means that the machines, your jobs will finish twice as fast and, well, everything is better for you now. If you are not using uh, our monthly plan yet, you should because we have a promo this, uh, this Blender conference and you can get one uh, week of rendering for free, uh, for one dollar, sorry, almost free, 
So in, in coffee terms, you know, uh, this is the price of the biscuit that they give you with the espresso. <laughs> anyway, uh, you'll need a, a code for that, so look me up and I'll be happy to give you one. Uh, and while talking to you guys uh, this year, it, it's a pleasure, by the way, e each and every year to talk to you guys again. Uh, somebody told me that he didn't realize that he needed the render farm until he thought, always thought that you need to have some big animation to, to start using a render farm. And then after starting using a render farm, he, he thought, no, that's not true. And it's not true. Well, that's true. And uh, <laughs> sorry, stage track. And uh, so, yeah, you don't need to have a big animation. You can have multiple small ones or just uh, one daily image that you want to, to render or just pretty much anything else. Uh, it's, it helps a lot with your workflow, with your delivery, and it helps you be less stressed in the end. Of course, you can get a cat for that, but uh, that doesn't help you with the rendering. <coughs> so even if you don't want to try our monthly plan, although you should, uh, you can try our other plan because it just works. So 10 years in the business, 10 years of rendering projects have taught us something, and this is why we can help you guys, no matter what you throw out in our direction, you can render it for you. And yeah, so, and then if you do this, if you use our farm and get more relaxed, you can also do this, get a cat. And uh, the, there are scientific studies that have proven that this way you can get twice as relaxed, right? <laughs> so that's all for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All right, then for the next presentation, we will have Alan on stage, and please can we switch to the other uh, computer? Awesome. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> is, is, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, can I see my talk? Okay. Hi, I'm Alan, and uh, I've been uh, trying out YouTube for, for, for about, 15 years, um, and most recently, I've been getting into this new thing called short form video content. Now, I know it has a reputation for being low effort, and I didn't want to be like that. So um, I wrote this script for a little sketch um, and uh, you know, shot it all on green screen. My buddy uh, Joey and I created a bunch of Blender assets and just like put it all together into this fun like virtual production of like a topical, comedy sketch, you know? And I, this is just highlights. You can see the whole thing on my channel. Um, but it, it, it went, I think, I think it came out pretty fun, and it did surprisingly well on YouTube for a short. But I did notice that, unlike with my usual sort of educational type of stuff that I make, this, which could, I guess, be considered art content, you know, posting art content online, had a slightly different vibe with the comments. Um, uh, from what I'm used to. And so, just for fun, I went ahead and read through all 1,600 <laughs> comments from across the different platforms and uh, did some data analysis to present to you guys in a way that you could hopefully understand. So the first thing to note is that the ratio of positive to negative comments was six to one, which is surprising and kind of awesome. Any YouTube creator should be happy with that, but it's not the whole story, okay? Because this comprised only 29% of overall comments. Most of the rest of them were either random words, jokes and riffs and stuff like that, or like people telling you, you know, what other existing media your original thing that you made up looks like, which filmmakers love to hear. Um, and then a tiny minority of comments, for me personally, take up the most real estate in my mind. And that is technical critiques, okay? Because that's kind of what I do. So if it's directed at me, I, I need to pay attention. So. Yeah, people said things like, you know, the stabilization there was not perfect, and this is, this is actually audio equipment and not on the racks, which is fine. Uh, but by far the most comments were about this little moment where the captain is clearly using what looks like a pipe wrench, but the sound effect I put on that moment when you watch the video is like a ratchet, like a sound, and people just delighted so much in explaining to me about this choice that I made which is wonderful to hear. Um, 
And now I forgot my place. But yeah, so I, I, I thought, this is a good, this is good. This is the teaching moment. And I had a polycam scan of the wrench. So I, told, I made this follow-up video where I explain, you know, this is actually a special ra uh, wrench that can transform into a ratchet. And in fact, it was even the hammer at the beginning of the video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, what I didn't realize is that by making this, I had accidentally created another piece of art content. So the whole paradigm of comments applied once again. So once again, an even higher ratio of positive to negative comments, which is awesome to see. Uh, but again, it was only a small portion of overall comments, most of the rest of which were either randomness or uh, people telling me that this looks like uh, Half-Life or, or Bioshock or whatever. And then, once again, a, a, a slightly increased minority of, uh, once again, technical critiques. But this time, they were actually well-informed and interesting and helpful. Essentially, you know, this consensus was that the, the specular is a little too high on these CG tools that are supposed to be rusty. And most, most importantly, there's no sense of weight to it, you know? Because if you're just, of course, if you're replacing a little stick with markers for like a big iron tool, it's, it needs to have that sense of weight. Hjalti would cry, you know? Um, and so that's legitimate criticism. It's very helpful. But here's the thing. Um, even if some of these guys are like VFX supervisors at ILM, what they're really doing is making a comment on the internet. And whenever you do that, you don't have all the context. You don't know the person, you don't know their goals. My goal was, my priority was the original short, right? Which I needed to shoot in a day and do it safely and quickly and efficiently, do things like hammer the hammer next to the lens and capture good audio. So I did purchase foam replicas of these tools to use in that short, which were rather shiny, had a, like a shiny finish and, and were very, very lightweight because that is what was needed for the production, okay? So when it came to the little follow-up joke video that I did spur of the moment, I actually wasn't replacing any objects with anything. These, this was the live action plates. The, the objects just happened to be shiny and light. And so I think in that context, my VFX work in matching the motion and, and the shading is actually on point, okay? So I guess, I guess that makes these very well-informed comments actually completely wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> and so I think, I think, I think we should all learn from the mistake that these people have made tonight. Because had they been signed up on my Patreon, they would have seen me chronicle the entire production process of the short, and they would have known about the foam props even before I shot the video. And then they wouldn't have made the choice to say these things, and then none of them would have ended up looking like a silly, pedantic weirdo in front of a theater full of Blender experts. Thank you. Awesome, so we have three presentations to go. Next up is uh, Peter. Give him a big round of applause as well. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for this nice slot. Now uh, everybody is going to be disappointed. <laughs> um, I want to talk about RenderUp, which I've been working on the past year. So imagine you worked a long day building your shot files for an animation film. We worked around all the library override issues. All the rigs worked finally. And then you're like, um, actually, it was very productive today. I have three shots to render tonight uh, before I go to bed. And I'm super tired, but I really need those three shots. So you fire up Google. Um, it's 2 a.m. in the morning. No, it's this really not an option. So you go into the good old text editor, start writing your your uh, Blender command line things, and then yeah, dash a no such file. Yeah, fuck. So then you figure out all of these issues, and then f uh, go to sleep, come up next morning. What you expect is this. What you get? Ah! Uh, <laughs> so, 
There's a solution I came up with, um, building a Google spreadsheet, type in all the stuff, and then make a uh, Python script that downloads all this stuff. But the thing is, if I want to give that to other people, they have to fool around with the Google Drive API, yada, yada, yada. So I thought, OK, not really a cool thing. So I ended up with this. Um, this is a render, like actually batch render job manager. Um, supposed to be the simplest one there is. Um, it's for you if you don't care about distributed rendering, if you don't care about um, like how are your shot files named, it's just going to come up with some kind of system with versions and everything. It's going to just uh, check if there are some renders. But yeah, you just drop in the, the stuff, load, drag, and drop. Um, if, if you don't do anything, it's going to just render a still. If you enter start an end frame, it's going to render out an animation. Just very simple. Um, you can download it there. I'd be happy if some other people, a part of me, would use it. Thank you. Thank you Thank you so much. And next up is Andrea. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here. But thank you. Uh, well, so it's not this one. OK, right, yeah. So my name is Andrea. Uh, I'm just a 3D mm, generalist, a freelancer. Today I would like to talk about, oh, it's here. Today I would like to talk about how to make anamorphic animation, of course, using Blender. And well, it's just sharing what I learned about this topic. OK, so what I mean with anamorphic, uh, that's sometimes also referred as a 3D billboard, is essentially this kind of content that's getting a little bit more popular on big screens. Um, that basically, it seems like there is a 3D physical object on top of this building. So this is a big impact, no? In general, what it is, is a kind of distorted image that align, or basically, that look good from one single point of view. So actually, this video is looking great from this specific point of view, but it's stretch if you see it from another point of view. So how to do it, or well, how I do it. So basically, I recognize some production steps. So I'm going to go very quickly uh, through it. So basically, collect everything, about all the information about the screen and location, identify a point of view. And then you have like a, you do a normal uh, CG production, let's say. Then there is a last step when you, let's say, rectify the image. So you make it flat. Well, the image is already flat. You know what I mean, after all. And then if you have a huge screen in your backyard, then you test. And if you don't, you simply pray. <laughs> so what I mean is that most of the time, you have the proven of truth at the very last moment, and you hope that everything aligns in real life and everything works, as actually did in my case, luckily. Uh, so basically, the first preparatory step you collect everything about the screen and the location. So it's a very specific custom uh, production, specifically for that screen, that shape, that resolution, and that point of view. So I reproduce this environment. It was an exhibition in that case. And I put, uh, I insert a camera, just pretending where the viewer should be at the venue, how it's going to look at the place, how it's going to look at the screen. I consider about maybe some blocking objects that may obstruct the view, like uh, another stand, for example, something that can um, stop the viewer, just to identify the ideal point of view. So at the end of this step, I will end up with two elements, the point of view, so basically a camera with position and uh, rotation, and the screen area. So after that, I exported these two elements, just for convenience, and you make like a standard, let's, I would say, CG production, like a 3D scene. You just have to be careful about, of course, leave a static camera. And all these 3D objects, they don't have to, let's say, overpass the silhouette of the screen. Otherwise, it's going to be cropped when you just rectify the image. So you end up with something that, in my case, it was looking something like this. Uh, so yeah, this is my 3D scene. 
It's very nice, but of course we can't play this video on the actual screen. We need to somehow, somehow rectify. So then there is a last step, last step, when actually you pass from this to that. And uh, in, again, I used Blender still for this last step. You might do it in some other post-production tools if you like. I, do it in, I did it in Blender. I use it a um, UV project modifier so that I have the UV just shaped on the, on the screen. And then you actually unfold this curved object and you make it like, like you physically, like you would do physically, like unfolding a uh, curved screen. And you end up with a flat image. At this step, as you can see, the image gets distorted. But from that point of view, it's going to be compensated. No? So it's going to be look good. So that's what I do. Uh, test and pray. Uh, so I recycle that kind of testing environment that I built before. I play this distorted video. And I check that from that point of view, the distortion is not visible. So you see the things correctly. And then, you know, just the final result, there's the video from the venue. It was looking like this. I made seven of this short animation for this specific work, but it's the same, pretty simple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we're going to head to the last talk of the evening. Uh, hello, everyone. I have a, an honor to be the last one today. So I will be very short. I'm the d developer of Blossomedon. It was known before as a Blender OSM. And I encourage you to try the latest, the latest version of the Don because it can import uh, 3D cities. One can see in Google Maps. It was made possible after Google had released a public API, API for that. So, and to get the done, what, what button to press? Ah. To get the done, simply type Blossom Adon in your favorite search engine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host the Lightning Talks. It went better than expected. So thanks to uh, the venue staff and to Inesh and Bastion for saving my little blender butt. Uh, <laughs> that's really appreciated. But don't leave just yet. We will have the uh, Susanna Awards ceremony coming up right next. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>so happy to be on this side of the stage for once. <laughs> Welcome to the Susan Awards for the 2023 Blender Conference. I'm very happy to be presenting them and off to best animation. And the winner for best animation this year is Space Tales episode two, yeah. Directed by Andra Battistoni. Come on up. <laughs> Here she is. Congrats, congrats. Hi. Congrats. Here, you can say a few words if you like. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> congrats. Thank you so much. So happy that you were here, actually, <laughs> for this. 
And on to best design. And the winner for best design is Secret Moon by Orin Cloud. So thank you for them. Congrats to the team. Uh, sadly, they're not with us today, so we'll be sending them the season. Hopefully, it reaches them. <laughs> and off to best short film. And the winner is Remove Hind Legs Before Consumption by Finn Meissner, Lukas Wind, and Leslie Herzog. Congrats to them. And again, they're not with us tonight, but uh, we'll be sending our wishes and <laughs> congrats with them, with the Suzanne also. So thank you so much for voting for the Suzanne Awards and for joining in today. And you can now go upstairs to party. <laughs>